What can you say about this whole situation with your assistant coach and Bessel and whether or not he's going to listen to you guys? The biggest part about that, to me, it's tongue in cheek. What does it mean? Our focus is not on things that are done a month ago. Our focus is on today. Where are we starting today? Obviously, things like this make news. They make headlines. They bring questions. You're going to question me about it. Tongue in cheek is the key to me. Move on. Meaning he said it, tongue in cheek. Uh, meaning whatever that means to you guys. That's how it was brought across in my, in my world. So I look at it and just say, hey, my focus is today to get the Toronto Maple Leafs Hockey Club prepared for this season. What happened yesterday, what happened two days ago, uh, it's all those things are things that are, are gone by and our focus should be on what we have to do today. Given what happened last spring, they took your assistance away, uh, do you feel you are in a position to succeed right now? How do you feel about that? Well, I, I think it, every year you come with a little bit of nervous energy that you've done the right thing that the group is going to grasp some of the things. There's always changes that do take place in organizations. And it happens at the player level, it has, happens at the management level, it happens at the coaching level, and it happens at the media level. There's always new people coming in and out. And the way we deal with it is, is this is the group that we're presented with. We have 60, almost 60 players here today testing. We have some young players that are going to challenge from the Marlies. We have some players that we acquired over the course of the summer. They're going to challenge for positions. And it's our job as a coaching staff to pick the right players. And it's their job as players to come in and prove they're worthy of playing on our hockey club. Do you feel under the gun, or is that this no different than any other year? As I've said, stated before, coaching in the NHL is a, you're under a microscope. This market might be a bigger microscope. But the issue is, is we have to win more hockey games than we did last year for sure. And you're always going to be challenged on whether you're able to sell your product or what you're selling, your players are buying. And that's the, the issue. How difficult is it to keep, to use your term from last year, the white your players from hearing the white noise, so to speak? Well, again, we take steps. We try to take steps that we're going to be able to control that. And it, and it can go as simple as, uh, you know, it's us against them mentality. You know, all for one, one for all. You know, like it's simple. Those are the things that you, you provide, but it's hard to live. We understand that. It's hard for our players in this market to go, not go uh, down the street and not be noticed. There's a tremendous amount of scrutiny that takes place. We understand that. That's the education that we're trying to bring to our players, that this isn't easy. Nobody says it's going to be easy, but it's not easy to play in the NHL. It's not easy to win in the NHL. It's difficult, and there are days that are more difficult than others. Randy, uh, going forward, your skills are high score, a high state player, eight-year contract. What is it like to coach him? What is it like to get him to buy into your, your product? Well, the thing about Phil, you know, he's, a, he's an athlete that has a, a specific off-the-chart skill set. When he gets a step on people, the, the players on the bench go, uh-oh, you ain't catching him. And it, the dynamics of a player like that, if I can remember that I've coached in Anaheim, was a Tamo Solani at the end of his career. And he had that same dynamics. When he got a half a step on somebody, you weren't catching that player. And it's the same type of dynamics with Phil. Phil's a very intelligent hockey player. Phil's a young hockey player, achieved a lot of success, personal success. And all we're trying to do is make him into a, a more complete hockey player, and we've done that. We think Phil Kessel's a better player today than he was two years ago. And I think you guys would agree. But is he the guy, if he's not, if he's doing things Phil's way, some stars do get some leeway. Does it affect your ability to sell your product or program to the rest of the line? I don't think so. I think, I think there, are, there is a double standard in sports. The talented people have to be given a little bit more of a rope. Talented people have to have some freedom to take their artistic values and, and go paint the picture, as to say. He is that type of player. He's a talented player. There's nobody in this room can say that, that he can't score goals. Well, I don't know. He just, I don't know if he hates me. <laughs> I haven't asked him. But we do talk. You know, we, we have conversations. And, you know, it's not like when we go walk by, we, don't, we ignore one another. That's, that's totally false.
Randy, on a season basis, how often will you reach out to Bill, any other of your top players, when you're looking at instituting a play or a strategy? Well, what we try to do is, is there's, a, there's always the beginning of the season, you try to identify your leadership group. And we want our leadership group to be as large as we possibly can. Every, every coach wants the same thing. You want to have 10 plus guys in your leadership core. Just because they have an A doesn't necessarily mean, oh, those are the only people that you rely on. Like we brought a Stefan Robida in here because he has leadership qualities and he's displayed them over the course of his career. We believe that, that he can help and support our leadership group. We think he still can play and make a contribution. But again, one of the assets that he brings to the table is he's proven that he's been able to go out and, and lead, compete, be a competitive and effective player. So those are the type of things that we're going to look to with some of the new people that we brought in. And it's a bit of an exaggeration when you mention uh, how hard it is for guys to come in here and uh, play in this city. I mean, the, the media here is not as tough as it is in places like Boston and Montreal, and these guys are making $78 million a year. Like, who who if they're recognized on the street? I don't quite understand that. No, I think that I, I look at it as, as that you're, you, the privacy that you're afforded in other markets, you're not afforded here. Is that bad? I don't think it's bad. I played here for two years. They got rid of me because I did so many things wrong <laughs> at that point, but that's a long time ago, you know? And I look at it, it's a privilege to play for the Toronto Maple Leafs. I think it's, it's just the greatest hockey market in the world. Now, there are things that come with it. There are things that, that you have to deal with here that you ne not necessarily would have to deal with another. So geez, that's all my explanation to it would be. It's not bad, it's, it's <laughs> life. Some people get caught up in it. We saw athletes historically get swar uh, swallowed up by cities. And we think that we take the necessary steps to educate our young players, to not get too in engulfed in what, your, what the outside influences can be. You're here a hockey player. You're here to play hockey, you're paid well, you know, go, go out and perform to the best possible level you can. What kind of effect does the continual damage control have on, you know, trying to produce a league team, though, when you, you're constantly have to deal with things like Lewicki's comments about character, uh, what happened yesterday, that sort of thing? I, I think it's, it's just the next one. I always say, well, no, it's next. <laughs> next! You know, when we're, we're checking off the, the list at, in, uh, as far as things to do in training camp. Next, oh, we did. We got to go over the forecheck. We do that next. Defensive zone coverage next. The events that take place outside the game, we have no control over. We have no control over. So there's certain things that you, you when you don't have control over it, all you can really do is recognize it, what's happening, go forward with your plan, but it's there. Deal with it and move on because the most important thing that we have is our next one. You've heard me say it a thousand times. The next game is the most important game. Tomorrow's the most important day in the life of a Toronto Maple Leaf because we're going to test tomorrow on the ice. That's the most important thing that we're going to leave here today knowing that that's going to happen. So prepare yourself to test out properly. I think, it, and again, I, I've said it before and I've said it the last, over the last little month, it, month here, it, Clarkie is, is in the reset. We feel that there's a big button, it's reset the button. He's not the type of player that we saw last year. Now there are things that, that we think that he can do to help himself and that we're gonna try and help him with. But he's a member of our hockey club. He's a Toronto Maple Leaf and we're gonna try and provide him with the tools that are necessary for him to beat David Clarkson, to make an, an impact for our hockey club. So does he get like a benefit of the doubt as far as where he might start him based on what he used to do before? In other words, Again, I write a lot of things down, and the, uh, the coaches write a lot of things down that go on the erase board, and the, you do those things based upon what you you feel you have in July, in August. Now we're at September. Now we're into the meat of where people have to earn the opportunity to play on the second line, where people have to earn the opportunity to play with Phil Kessel, where people have to earn the opportunity to play with Nazi, Nazem Kadri, or Nazi, Nazem Kadri has to earn that opportunity to play on the second line. And we think that that's a healthy environment that we can create. Competition for the position. And we realize there's lots of contracts out here. There's eight, I think there's 17 one-way contracts at forward. <coughs> 
We know that there's, that there's going to be competition for the position, and we welcome our younger players to step up and challenge. So after the last year, Randy, after what happened to your assistants, uh, with all the stuff that swirling around from Milwaukee on down, what kind of position do you think you can put in to succeed with this team this season? It's just another year for as far as I'm concerned. I, I have a job to do. Uh, I have an opportunity to change this group, to earn the respect back for this hockey club. This group of hockey players, we believe, is going to give us that, that chance. And we're going to work extremely hard day in, day out, to provide our players with an environment that they can have success in. Thus, we feel that we're, we'll be able to challenge. We're going to challenge our players to be better. We are already have challenged our players with the conditioning assignments throughout the course of the summer. Right. We're going to challenge our players to play a higher, higher level. Right. To follow up uh, Steve's question, when you look at your whiteboard now, with all the changes you've made, do any one of your forward lines or defense parents look the same as the way you finished last year? Well, it, you know, there's this challenge that that you do inside of it to say, okay, well, Bozak, Kessel, and, and Van Reems, like, that idiot, mix, uh, break up that line. I know you're saying that, but you're going to say it if I do it. <laughs> but, you know, I remember when uh, Lupel, Kessel, and Bozak were the top scoring line for the first 40 games before I got here, because we played them in Anaheim, and they, they kicked our, our butt. You can remember that. We haven't had Lupo really healthy for an extended one full season. He's had to, to deal with injuries. So there are things that are available to us, and if we're going to try to create a different look in our forward group, and I'm saying a different look of, of saying we have nine forwards that we believe out of that 18 that can provide a decent amount of offense. Are we going to be able to cre create three balanced scoring lines? Are we going to be able to create a fourth line that's going to have more energy and is going to be able to kill penalties on a regular basis? That's our mindset. We still think we have to have toughness, but it, it's, it's not a toughness as per se. We have to be team tough. You watch the teams that play and have success into the playoffs. They're team tough. They're hard to play against. Everybody talks about the LA Kings and they're the model because they won the Stanley Cup. How many teams could afford a $5.5 million fourth line center? This one? <laughs> okay. But again, the players make what they make, and it's up to us to put them in a position that what's best for the team. And the LA Kings made that decision, and nobody in here would say Rogers is not a, a fourth line center, right? He's not. He's not. He's, he's a great player. So just to be clear, Randy, are you saying that if, depending on the, the competition goes your way, that you could change that first line potentially? I, I, we're willing to, to experiment in training camp and try to create, I'm telling you, that's what we're going to try and create, is nine forwards that can, are, are going to be able to provide us with offense. You start right. with, you start with um, Booth and Santa Rally together, given that they've had success. They've had success historically together, and that's, it would be foolish not to. But it depends how everything else plays out also, because you have to think of the, the nine forwards, again, nine forwards. What's going to be the best, best mix for this group to go out and challenge and play to a high, high pace, play a, an in-your-face game, to play to a game that we're worthy of outworking the opponent? And that, that is, our, is our challenge. Randy, lost in, uh, your club, lost in the shuffle of all the Castle stuff is the fact that there was an emphasis on the breakout for a team who struggled to get it all in last year. Will there be a lot of emphasis on this season on having a new breakout? I think, again, I think puck, puck support and a new breakout, there is only so many ways to bring the puck out of your zone. And is there five, is there 10, is there 15? I don't know, there's a lot, okay? But the effective ways, are, I could say they'd be on one hand, that are used in the NHL. Now, Phil is a player that wants to utilize his speed. He's a player that we think that when we get him the puck in certain situations, wherever he is on the ice, he has the ability to strike fear in the defenders. You can see it in their eyes. 
You can see the panic that takes place. So whatever we devise has to be a, uh, something that he's comfortable with and that works for our hockey club. Randy, your uh, goaltending situation, is Jonathan Bernier completely healthy and you're confident you can carry the load of his team that let bring down? Again, we can't ignore what Bernie did for our hockey club. As simple as that. And we can't ignore what James Reimer has done for our hockey club. Here we are again at training camp, and the question's going to be, well, who's number one? Is he clear-cut? Is he this? Is he that? Well, right now, we would have to say that, and I'm going to say it, 1A and 1B. And you laugh at me, and you, you'd say, well, what's he? He's full of this. He's full of that. Well, the, the reality is, is if you go to every team, you have to have somebody that's going to emerge and be your, your guy. Usually that happens over the course of the first 40 games. That's what happened to us last year, where Bernie you can't, we can't ignore how well he played for our hockey club. And we think that the uh, uh, time that James Reimer has spent with our group, I think he has a better understanding of what happened. But we're not casting James Reimer to the side. We're going to need James Reimer to go in and play and win us hockey games. It's as simple as that. Is that for his health now? Is he yeah, he's fine. Randy, when you look back at training camps that you've overseen, how competitive, competitive does this one seem, both in terms of jobs available and spots in the first two lines or wherever in the lineup? Again, you know, it, this is a, a new group. We think that the addition of some veteran players that are on, uh, that have played in positions that we're looking to fill, that we are maybe looking to have a little bit of a change, looking to create the nine forward mentality of, not, of having three lines to provide offense, that there's an opportunity for those types of players to make a contribution. There's young players that we look at that have, are, have been in the American Hockey League and have had success there. Now, can somebody come up out of that group and challenge for a position? You know, the writing's going to be on the wall here over the next four or five days. We start on the ice on Saturday. Uh, we have a practice and then we have a scrimmage. There would be two sets of practices and two sets of scrimmage. Then we do that Saturday and Sunday and we start right into the exhibition games and we play basically four games in three days. So we need bodies and we need people to go out and show us what they have. There's their opportunity to have, make a uh, solid first impression. Randy, do you like the ingredients of a better penalty kill beyond Jonathan just given the new additions to the hockey club? Again, we, we designate and target some people that we think can, can kill penalties. Daniel Winnick and Leo Komarov have killed penalties effectively in the league. So are, are we going to use them? Well, I would say that we, that's the plan. But what if one of them gets hurt? One of them's not available to us. Those are things that we're, we don't know. We can't see into the future. But again, that whiteboard takes a workout. situation with Nylander, is that like Again, a young player, very talented. Uh, in these situations, you, what you want to do is you want to protect that young player a little bit, but yet you want to see him display his skills. You want to play him with players that are, are capable of reading the play and making plays at his level and see how, how rugged he really is. If you look at him, he looks like he's 14 years old. You know, He's a young looking kid, but he's not afraid to go into the dirty areas. I don't know if any of you guys are up in, in London. He takes the puck to the net. You know, I, I don't know if he can do that against Sedano Chara. You know, you, you really, that's the question that comes. Do you foresee changes to the style of play from last year to this year? Well, I think we have to change. We, we begged, borrowed, stole, tried to convince that we had to play more of a puck possession game early in the season. We did that from middle of November on. But then we got injuries, we had suspensions, we had people that you know, weren't available to us. Through the month of December, we had Nazem Kadri, Peter Holland, Trevor Smith, and Jay McClement as our centers. And they got us through. We got through that. But after that point, we all know what happened. You don't want to be the last? But you did try to turn them into a cycling team. Clearly, you were attempting that over and over, trying to get that message through last season, and they insist on being a, a Russian team. And commented about that quite a bit. I mean, is that still your philosophy going forward, that you need them in this league 
this division to be that collective? I think if you, what we try to do, we're all copycats. The teams that are having success in the NHL right now are puck possession teams. They play an up-tempo, in-your-face, strong forechecking, but as far as the offensive zone, they control the puck at, for more extended periods than we, what we do. And that's a, a challenge for us. Last one. All right.